Okay, so I call the meeting to order at uh, 9.02. Um, Eric, do you want to do a roll call? Yes. So, um, we have Tom Beatty. Present. Jean Grissom. Present. Jeff Hanson. Present. Jeff Next on the agenda is approval of the minutes from our April 19th meeting. So I have a little thing. Okay. So it says the meeting was called for by um, our meeting is this morning, it's called on the 28th at 9. Right. I think it's this thing. So. Yep. Yes. So that's under number one. We have a motion to approve with that change. I'll move. I'll second. Okay. We have a. Excuse me. <coughs> we have a motion by uh, Jean and a second by uh, Lauren to approve the minutes with the change on number one. Uh, vote. Ayes. Please say aye. 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 Nays. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Go on to number three, public invited to be heard. Anyone from the public? Go on to number four, organizational updates. A hey, bylaws update status. So Erica, where are you in terms of getting those signed? Um, we are over, um, Michelle Gomez has them uh, ready to sign for the mayor to come tomorrow, so tomorrow. Yeah, and no, I think I have to sign it too, so. It'll all be done tomorrow. So it passed the commissioners and mm -hmm. then it has to officially be signed. Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're good. Uh, on the B, uh, LHA Advisory Board Member Election Interview Process. I'm going to probably jump in on this yeah. one. So um, when we were working on it with our with the city clerk's office, we had a thing happen. Um, they posted the positions like they would have in the past for the advisory board, not, no, for the housing authority board, not the advisory board. And um, so, you know, uh, some time ago, the initial origin, the initial question came up actually with Lauren when, when she moved and the city attorney advised. So city boards and commissions have a charter requirement that says you have to live within the, the city of Longmont. That was in play for the Housing Authority Board because the council is now the Housing Authority Board and you're an advisory board to the council. That doesn't come into play because that's a city charter requirement. So that's why Lauren was able to stay on the board. They posted it as the advisory board, not as, not, they posted it as the authority, not the advisory board. And the city and the attorney and I were talking about this, and because of how we're trying to keep everything square and separate, um, we're, we're call, calling a timeout on this because we don't want the city council to interview and necessarily select board members at the city council capacity and then the housing authority at the same time. So the city attorney would rather do those at separate points to keep that separation in play. All kind of goes into what we have to tell Todd about how we're separating everything else. Um, in that conversation, one of the things that we wanted to talk to you all about is really defining what we want in terms of, of advisory board members and what what kind of skills you all are looking for and um, is there anything in particular? So, for example, we don't have anyone from finance on the board, or your finance, right? Your finance. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do exactly? Uh, uh, I'm an accounting director at CU. Okay, I've had years and years of auditing. So, you're the finance, we don't have a lender. Lender or like a developer? Or a developer. Well, yeah, yeah. Developer. Yeah, yeah. They're in the okay. she's yeah. in the developer. So, like a lender. And so, what we wanted to what, kind what, of. What's his face used to be? I can't remember his name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to talk to you all today is if you kind of had what is the mix you would like to see on this, 
Is there only open to you all so that we can take that back to the board and say, here's kind of the mix that the advisory board thinks they need. Um, and I think it's even more important now because we're, we're full tilt into development and we'll give you some updates on other things. Um, but we wanted to open that question up to you all to say, what do you want to see? Is there anything in particular that you want to see in terms of the board? Then we're going to probably go back, have to reopen um, as the housing authority for applicants. And for the, as the housing authority board reopen as applicants for the advisory board oh, okay. and go down that base. Okay, that's so. good because I forgot to apply. Yeah. No, I think it's. Okay. I just figured you were like, oh, this is my easy way. Out. I'm yeah. so yeah. focused on the spoke. It's also because your mission and purpose has shifted right. to this advisory capacity. Right. So you have, there's some different um, reasons to really rethink the skill set yeah. piece in terms of how you advise the Board of Commissioners, but also, um, and you did this at your last meeting with the residential piece, that residential connection. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really good time to just talk about, in general, as the Vermont Housing Authority Advisory Board, what, what is really the mix of folks and skills and values that you want? And what I got messed up, I mean, I was talking to Michelle about it. So obviously we've had some challenges within our city clerk's office. I don't know if you knew. Uh, Don, John, his son passed away. So we were all covering and struggling. And Michelle goes, well, we did it this way the last time, which is true. But the last time was two years ago, because last year we didn't do it because we did the conversion. So, and we just didn't have the brain power, so that kind of led it all to where we are today, but um, it, it kind of works out, and I think we need to have the conversation. So, I'm going to turn it over to you all now to kind of tell us. What are the skill sets? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I really like the person that we have able to have preferably the real estate um, tenant. And, and possibly even real estate development kind of, but I would love to have somebody that has that kind of uh, uh, experience to bring. Uh, I think it would help us greatly. And I'm going to miss Cameron being on the board because I could always look at him with a question mark and he put an exclamation mark and I could. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. I agree with Jean, and at one time, it was on our list of what we were looking for. And I went back through my stuff and I couldn't find it. So I just was wondering why it was not on it. I think your preference, I think at least you what Harold would like to yeah. see on it. And I think Harold's now asking what we want to see on it. Yeah. Um, How many board members do we, spaces do we have total? Five. Five. Yeah. Five. Is there, is are we, why are we restricted to five? So I think we did five because in the transition we, we wanted to we wanted to keep the people who were involved again. Because mm -hmm. Arlene joined like right when this thing started. Right. And we kind of, I think we said we need to keep the, the band Stick together. Yeah. And, and we didn't want to have open slots that created quorum issues. And so we wanted to keep the band together knowing that there were so many moving parts and trying to bring someone new into the mix yeah. would have, I mean, it would have been crazy. Arlene was drinking water from the fire hose <laughs> yeah. and we weren't even in the depth of right. what we were doing. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's why we did it. We could also say if you want seven, we could make the recommendation of adding seven. And that would be another bylaws change. So that right. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. 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 Right. So, yeah. so if you all want seven, that's something we can put down at seven. But yeah, if you can just kind of say, Here's what you kind of want in the mix because Cameron was, I don't know if you all knew this, he, he did real estate, he did okay. development, yep. he, he did all of those things and so he was a yep. good conduit for a lot of that. So, uh, But you all let us know and we'll put that together and then I'll take it back to the board and say we're doing this and here's what the advisory board wants to see and we'll reopen. Now it, it's so the quorum is set by a total number mm -hmm. of five, it's not the number of bodies that are in a seat. Okay. It's the majority. Yes. Yeah. It's the total Percentage. number of the defined group. Okay. So at one time, and I'm thinking back to quite a while ago when we were talking about LHDC, if they disbanded, you thought some of those people 
might add to the board with your dad? Add to it? Is that still? One of them is interested in it. He is an attorney. Um, he may be more interested in if we have to do a show though or something that I can talk to him and see if he's interested. It's Stephen. What's Stephen's last name? Adam Easton. On the LHBC board. Morgan. Morgan. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kendra. <laughs> yeah. I just thought yeah. she was on the board, so I thought she or oh. was on the board. Okay. Not on the board. You were on the uh, what do you call it? The Hearthstone and Lodge board. board. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> well, I have a little list going here that I was just thinking about when we were talking the um, finance perspective, developer, lender. This could be two or it could be one tenant focus slash community organization representative legal attorney. And that's like six. I would even say, I would add construction. You know, somebody that maybe, okay. I got a hard head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have literally spent the past three weeks every day on a construction okay. site. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a, I don't have a, I'm not a construction, I'm not a builder, but. Right. Yeah. Just listed on the yeah. But uh, if we want construction management, that type well, that's of what I yeah, knowledge. So like, actually, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Okay. yeah. And the Chodo, is that something that would be like community? Yeah, like, it's community housing and... development organization. And so these are things we're trying to figure out. Because you get special finance, special money for those. Yeah, so this is what we were, as a No, and what we were trying to figure out, this is really related to the LHCC, um, the work that we're doing, and we were winding that up and bringing it in. Um, LHCC was historically the Chodo. Um, in Colorado, they changed so many of the financing mechanisms that there was really nothing for Chodos to do. All of the money starting to come forward, we're starting to see where there is a need for a Jodo here. Um, there just wasn't a lot of money circling around the market, so we're trying to figure out on the LHDC side what do we need to do and how do we need to do it. And how would that interface with LHA? Would they be like a partnering organization or Probably. not like an, uh, they wouldn't be separate like LHDC has their own projects and we have our own projects? No, because the, be a partnership. What, what we're, and this is I think what's changing the landscape a little bit of what we need. Um, uh, taking down LHDC and bringing it into LHA is really putting LHA squarely in the development world. Whereas yeah. historically, yeah. the LHA board relied on the LHTC board for mm -hmm. development. That's why we thought we needed to have this conversation. So it would be an ancillary organization that would partner. It could be, uh, we could create our own 501c3 that's a Chodo. We could say our center, do you want to be a Chodo? Or any of these other organizations we could go to. We just quite, we haven't quite wrapped our hands around what exactly we're still trying to figure out how we take down the LHCC. And once we get uh, Christman two legal documents done, that will then say Christman one legal documents and then start sending the chain to fall and the rest of the properties because that's going to be the master process to do it. And but, um, define Chodo, that's a relatively new term. Community housing okay. development organization. So those are national organizations. Okay. Um, it just, and I don't know what Lisa saw in Nevada, but in Texas, they were pretty active and you had a lot of money. There was something that happened in the funding in Colorado that made those less important. Hmm. And now funding's coming through again. Okay. And so. Okay. But it's a federal, yeah. But I think it's something we should take advantage of because money that LHA would not have access to yeah. from the feds yeah. for development yeah. and other sources. So I think it would be smart to look at that. And just from from a look, talking about that shift to development, I can tell you like BCHA, we develop our own properties mm -hmm. um, differently than what LHA does. And we are now a team of five developers. So I mean, it's a heavy lift. Yeah. That's why I was pretty much brain dead for three weeks because I was just focused on getting a certificate of occupancy. Um, they had neighbors and 
Yeah. <laughs> I I thought of nothing else for, for quite some time. Sure. Yeah. I'm still thinking yeah. about it. Yeah. But um, it's a it's a lot of work. Um, yeah. So I think it would be a good thing to look at. It's a lot of work in terms of more positions. Mm, well, the Chodo is separate. There's a separate work. organization. Yeah. Um, but I meant to link it up. Well, uh, Molly yeah. is a developer, and then you guys have hired another developer. Oh, yeah. so okay. we've, we've, we've got we've, two. We've got great three. fully staff. Okay. Um, right. and, and, they're, um, and, and part of the difference is in what Lauren said we do it different, is we do more of a partnership model. Yes. So yes. you bring in developers who have that capacity, expertise, and ability. Yeah. So they take the construction curve all the way to CO. We're really more on the finance side. Yeah. And so instead of hiring positions, we're contracting via the partnership to do that. Now, once we start generating more revenue, that may change. But we don't have enough revenue to do it. So we've got to build with partnerships to then get a revenue stream to maybe figure it out. But we're leveraging, I think the last time Molly ran the, job, ran the numbers, we're leveraging probably, what was it, 15? I can't remember the heads so many of these, but yeah, there were so many revisions. I don't know. You know, so we're putting in 1.8 million into Christman two yeah. out of a 20 million dollar project. Yeah. So less risk. Yeah, less risk, and we're leveraging these dollars. Now we don't own it right away, but we'll own it in five years. In five years, like we did with Christman one. Thing. Yeah, and so that's a big difference because then we'll take down Christman one and two. <laughs> So we'll have what is it, forty million dollars worth of property for about two point three million dollars of investment. So, um, I just, so what I heard in terms of the skill sets was construction, lender, developer, legal, and a preference for real estate tenant real estate development law. Is that, and then finance, and then a tenant or community focus. In terms of the finances, are I would say tenant and community focus. So separate. Because I think that's I'm seeing something. Cool. This is the direct the director's <laughs> perspective. Jean brings a tenant focus. I think Arlene brings a community focus. Yeah. And I think those are separate things. Right. Especially as we talk about ways to bring in money for the community, but from the community for our tenants, like what we are doing with these conversations, figuring out what they would like to see. Oh, yeah. And is there anything specific relative to the finance side that you'd be interested in? And is that different than lender or are they the same? I think they need to be different because a lender is going to understand the pro forma, the money going into a project, um, CHAPA related stuff, you know, tax credits. Whereas if you're just coming from a purely um, finance ARAP type. Um, yeah, perspective it's different, different. Yeah. yeah I have a little bit of understanding about the lender stuff but I'm still waiting through my, in my own experience yeah, you'll be familiar so. with uh, let's just see a lot of side of it as well mm -hmm. um, just <clears throat> and then a question given that the bylaws haven't been changed is it appropriate for the advisory board today to make the recommendation to move five to seven and then that would be the document that goes I don't know the process um, yeah so if you all want us to make a bylaw to change to go to five to seven then we would just take that recommendation add change the number and then run it through the, the board but then also you saw too Michelle that it's appointed yeah the members. quorum a majority oh. of the then appointed members shall constitute a quorum for this group. So we have four so we've got of five. No, today. that's a little different from other advisory boards. Is it? I think so. No, that's the same for my board. Because it, there's majority. some we have quorum issues because we don't have appointments. Right. And so they have different. But. I mean, that, I'm just reading no, that's good. No, that's good. That's so we can up at the seven. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm open to having seven as long as it's not eight or nothing. Although we don't vote on anything really, so. Uh, I'm just looking for input. Yeah. You know, having different minds on things. It's important. It's is important. Uh, um, I don't want to get stuck in a one way of thinking mode. You know what I'm saying? So I would say, yeah, our recommendation is. Seven. If you don't want to take a vote on that, no. So what we what we will do is then once we take your so so we have someone on the development side here, finance, community, resident, and then we'll look at these other things and say, here's what they're thinking we need. And here's what we need to fill, and then we'll circle back and reopen. Yes, yeah, so that's the next conversation is about reopening and the timeline for that. So, okay. what I would like when it's reopened is for the advisory board members to get a notice, um, and I think we can reach out to um, expand the our network to apply because. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I know more than just residents. Right, right, right. Yeah, you all do. Um, but um, but we can tap on resources and and uh, expand the number of people that apply. But I need to know timing and process. And I think if we get that information, it can help us and, and move it along, and make it easier for people to apply. And do we care if the people who do apply if they meet these needs? Like a someone who has you know, landlord tenant real estate attorney, if, if they don't, if they're not a Longmont resident, so say they live in Lafayette and they want to join because they want to use their expertise, are, are we worried about that? I mean, because I know I no longer live there. So what, what the next steps are is the interview guide, which Molly started to kind of go over with you at the last meeting. And so you all will interview the applicants and then you all will dis decide who you're going to recommend to the board of commissioners to appoint. And so I don't, if, if geographic residency doesn't matter, I, I don't. I think it would only, I mean, if you're looking for a specific skill, skill, skill. set, I think if you had someone with a skill set who lived in Longmont and someone who didn't, I would err to decide that the person that lived in Longmont. But if the skill set is not, then I think, you know, that's the question is, is the skill set the most important issue, or is this? And those are some of the things we have to work through. I'm trying to figure it out, but that's a way. I mean, that's a way. If, if the residency is not an issue, which Eugene said it's not, that's the way I would do it. Is to say, yeah, you're open, but prefer right. residency and law. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. And then timeline wise, I'd say. So, 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 I don't want to jump to that. If you want to finish the move from five to six. Well, yeah, let's let's have a vote on that. Make a motion. Is it going to affect the timeline? Because like my my timeline ends in June. Right. Um, so, it, what is it going to affect it if we if we move it to seven? We may have make to carry you all forward. We have to figure that out. Yeah. But. Because I mean, if, if it's not, if we do five, we keep it at five and we can reopen faster, I think that's beneficial to keep us on the board if that's the way it goes. Well, we can do seven and then if we just don't get enough applicants and we can fill what we can and then reopen again if we need to. In the bylaws, do you want to say a minimum and a maximum in case you come in into that issue? So the way council does the city boards is two appointments a year. So if you end up with a vacancy, you can go again in December. in December. So so you could say seven. You only fill five, that's fine, and reopen in December to fill the other two. And actually, that's what the senior board's doing. We just upped from seven to nine. Uh -huh. And we chose not to do this cycle, and because it didn't timing wise didn't really fit anyways and we'll just wait till December to fill those two new spots. So I think there's like Carol said, we just have to figure that yeah. out, but I think there's options. Could we do that then? Just carry the people forward to December and open it up then rather than try to hurry and get in and out. You could
could go with the bylaws that Harold and the mayor are going to sign tomorrow and then go back five. to the board of commissioners to up to seven at a later date and meet with the December cycle. I think since we have applicants, I think what I would rather do is, I think what my advice would be is to go ahead and we go back to the board with the motion to increase it to seven and to really talk about what you need and, and then continue until we can post and, and then that way we can hold the applicants that we have in place now and not and just add to it based on what we have. That's what I would think is the most balanced approach. But I could not, we can knock that out either the 24, we can knock that out either the 24th or the 31st of the board meeting. I'm talking to council tonight about what they want to do. Um, the 31st makes more sense, but it's after Memorial Day. And so I'm not sure who's here and who's not here. So I've got to talk to them, but if they choose the 31st, we can run this pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's not hard to change the number in the bylaws. Section 2 for composition. Uh, the LHAAE shall consist of seven members. I'll make the motion. I'll second. All right, so we have a motion by Lauren, a second by Jean uh, to increase the membership to seven. seven. Yep, no problem. Um, vote uh, ayes. Aye. Aye. Days. All right, motion passes unanimously. All right, so next on the agenda. Um, Can we go over what you wanted to see? So what I what I think I heard from you all was somebody that's on the development side, somebody that has legal experience. You know, if you could get somebody that has development legal experience, uh, that would be great. Um, if you could get the all in, which is resident development you know a broader legal base that would be great someone on the finance side that understands the accounting and the single audit functions um, a broader community representative and then a residential representative and a lender so and, and I said priority wise if you have legal and the lender side I'm about your top two so Harold, um, what Molly had written up was that council wanted the interviews with the city boards done by June 4th or June 18th. So when you talk to them about whether it's the 24th or the 31st, oh, so we need to figure out when we're going to interview the three applicants we have or if we're going to wait till we reopen. So we will figure, so if it's the 24th or the 31st, either on the 24th or the 31st, I'm going to say the advisory board A wanted more members and so here's um, an amendment to the bylaws to create more members. We also had a conversation about the skills that were needed on the board and here's what they outlined in terms of what they think needs to be on the board based on the work that we're doing, the, the move from LHDC, bringing development in, all of these issues, we'll need to change that as well. And then are you open to us lagging a little bit? Does that include keeping us on? Until yeah, that'll have here. to keep okay. the existing board, or may have to <clears throat> have them do a motion to keep the existing members until we go through the process. Yeah. So I'll reapply I would say Molly will probably send out a new Google poll based on what happens uh, okay. tonight and, and the later. Yeah. So we'll hold that. We won't schedule interviews until we have more direction. Yeah. We currently only have, if we're gonna hold our positions, then we're only interviewing for one person. Three people. Yeah, if we go to seven, if we go to seven. Okay, yeah. okay through the seven then we're good. Yeah. 
And, and we do currently have two new applicants, brand new folks, both residents. Both residents of Longmont? Both, both residents of LHA. Oh, oh properties. Yeah. Oh, property. Okay. Same property. Yeah. Two residents. Great. We'll get that working and get it to the board either on the 24th or the 31st. And then Mara will be back in touch about it. Do the full. Yeah. And will I interview uh, Nikki as well holding my spot then? Or I face a member? Because I'm not replacing myself. I mm -hmm. just want to make sure that we don't. No, run you'll into still have to do the interview. So the and interview me. panel will be Arlene. Arlene and Jean. And perhaps, yeah. And we'll see if we can get Cameron in there. Then, in, in this case, if I need to, I may. Because I didn't apply for this round, so. Yeah, I just figured that out. Just, just let me know if I need to. I'll, I'll still reply to the doodle poll either way. Yeah. Well, and apply. Okay. And apply. If it reopens. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Somebody just kind of knocked me over the head with a sledgehammer when that happened. So that's <laughs> Clearly, I need it. I'll come back down. <laughs> yeah, just bug me. Lisa, with it. Send me the paper. I'm like, I have all my emails and everything. I'll, I'll head it. Resident complaint. <laughs> there you go. Then I'll jump on it. <laughs> But yeah, we should have asked this question the last time about what you want on it, and it just didn't hit till the fiasco on the post didn't hit. And I think we did kind of talk about it a long time ago. It's good to make it really clear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then um, Arlene just brought up a good point. Is, uh, I think the next meeting will be Cameron's last one. We'll get it when we get everything through for all of your research. Um, yeah, I'm gonna give him a bottle of scotch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you sniffed through all the boards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, I thought you want to share since it. Oh, yeah, so I'm going to start. So, <laughs> Christman 2, um, we're, we're now moving through the financing piece. The, uh, we got everything approved in terms of dealing with the securities um, on that, so we have it covered. Uh, we're now shooting for closing early June. It's just the, the lenders and everything are just sliding. Uh, probably. It looks like all the permits are ready to go and the designs are in. So I would probably estimate that we're going to be in, they're going to start construction as soon as it closes um, on a timing perspective. So it'll be mid June, July, and we're going. Can I get a refresher here? Sure. Mm -hmm. I know you would have learned the age, but don't. Um, Christmas, the design is how many? How many units? And 78. 78, and this is going to be families, everybody? Yes. Okay. All right. Because um, we were talking when we did a family to have a designated child care center. Mm -hmm. Is that included? It's not because of when this came in. Okay. Um, I think they do have some open areas. What, what we're doing on the city side to kind of get at some of these things is is so um, in within our community services division, we're engaging our children youth and family services department, okay. and they're working with Lisa in terms of interacting on those properties. Test right. case right now is Aspen Meadows neighborhood, yeah, because that's our only family property. But we will probably try to replicate the same thing there, just like we're partnering with senior services on mm -hmm. our age restricted properties. And then as we continue to look in the future. Uh, we may look at some of these components, especially at this parcel right here as we start yes. the development. Yeah. I will talk a little bit more about some of this okay. as I move into the next development because it shifted some things financially for us um, on the news on the second one. But go ahead. I was just going to add that 
there is some movement. It's a little premature within the community around some affordable child care. may not be on site, but there is some things unfolding. Yeah. So um, that, that would be a good thing. But I think I'm way premature on that. Yeah, so. I mean, and we're in that conversation, too, because as part of our ARPA funding, um, and I have some meetings set up with the county, I met with folks that are doing this, and so we're trying to look at some options for some affordable child care that we'll have to work in terms of these properties. And I mean, if there's a gap, we may have to address some transportation issues, but that's another. Yeah. I think yeah. that's critical. I think, you know, just like going back to where I used to have to do your child care, it's critical to be able to have that. So, so is it Sunset or Christmas 2 that's going to close in? Christmas 2 is closed. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to go to Sunset Heights or Project Bluebird. Um, we're still trying to get Bluebird off of this. Um, <laughs> I don't know where it came from. <laughs> None of us know where it came from. We all called it Sunset Heights and then somehow it got changed to Bluebird. So Friday we were just notified by Chapa that we did receive the 9% tax credits. Wow. And so that project's going to be going forward. Um, it's a little bit different than Christman 2 because Christman 2 was the non-competitive 4%. Design and everything already started. When you're in the 9% competitive round, you don't start design until you get it. So we have some basic um, land use layouts they are going to start moving pretty quickly on design and moving that forward. Um, lesson learned in Christman 2, so you all know about it, we're going to be co-developer on this, so we're going to be co-applicants on all of the submittals to the city. Kind of got us on Christmas too, just because of the, what was on one line. Um, so, great news there that, that we got the 9%, we're going to be moving. The other good news associated with the 9% is that we, as far as the ARPA funds, I think we plugged in 1.8 or 1.9. Did you get that other debt financing for the yep. dollar? Uh, so, well, on Christmas too? For the 9%. There was something going on with the state where if you were applying for 9%, you could apply for some additional funding. Yeah, so we'll... we'll I had one million three um, the per for, unit. for Sunset Heights yeah. in development. Let me see. I'm pulling it up right now. And one, yeah. Yeah, so I think they're doing all of that. In terms of the nine percent, but we did, they just announced the nine percent awards Friday afternoon. I know because as soon as we got we got Willoughby Corner for BCHA also got right. which I was like I hope we're not like up against each other. But I immediately emailed Molly. I was like, did we get it? Yeah, we got it. So that's exciting. So um, on the ARPA side, we allocated one point three million for Sunset Heights, and the, the reason we did that was because. If we didn't get the 9% tax credits, we were going to use that $1.3 million to bridge the gap and essentially create a financing model that looked like a 9% tax credit with $1.3 million. Uh, that frees it up. And so what we're starting to talk about now, and this is more global to the suites and Sunset Heights, is how we can use that $1.3 million to partner with other organizations in the, in the community to create space for them to use. Specifically, we're really looking at recovery space uh, for people who are in recovery. And so uh, I've started having conversations with Recovery Cafe, which is a local nonprofit that supports people in recovery. Um, if we can use this money to facilitate a partnership there, then they will provide recovery services to the residents of both the suite and uh, Sunset Heights. Uh, by getting them on site, it may develop into something a little bit more where we have more space for other nonprofits to help with us. But it really is about bringing in community services to support the residents in the community. Um, we're going to start talking to Element about, and it's either Element or it's at the suites, but some configuration of, of how can we do sober living tours uh, because we're starting to see that from some of our tenants at the suites. I mean, we've heard that Arlene was there where they moved around the topic, but when you talk about to individuals at the suites more directly, they would really like to live on a floor where it was a sober living floor. And so there are things now that are going to start coming into motion 
that we've really never had the ability to to work with. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, but um, at least at this location, at least at this location, it lets us test out how we can do it. And I think that there are things that we need to figure out system wide as we're building additional units and how we can really look at creating silver living floors and across the system and because we see these issues at every property we just haven't had the ability to do it and, and so these are some things that we're starting to percolate we'll be keeping you all up to date but yeah we got some funding so uh yeah, we're, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we're fully staffed now from the city side, so um, we got a really strong crew uh, that um, is, is uh, one that's coming from Seattle, or, or was in Seattle but moved back home to Littleton, has a ton of experience in the live tech world and the development world, met with her yesterday. Um, someone's coming from Montana or Wyoming. Um, so they're all now working and we're starting to move on affordable, attainable and all of these issues. And um, so they we will sign to Sunset Heights and then in about a month we're going to start on this one. We're going to start building this, this project and uh, reaching out to um, setting up meetings hopefully with um, Indiegwell and start getting this together. Uh, and then they're already starting to work on the resyndication of Village Place so we can get that done this year. So uh, we will have one under construction, one in development process, one in pre-development process and financing, and one in resyndication by the end of the year. Welcome to the party then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So can I have kind of a clarification question. Could you explain to me what sober living actually is, means? Um, I wish I had the person in here to talk about it. But, um, Michelle, do you? It generally means that the, the space, whether it's a floor or a wing or a, or a home, is an alcohol-free and drug-free. So then there are usually rules around that because people often Relax, but um, it generally has a, a process for that. But it you move in knowing that there's no products on in your unit or on the floor. It is a sober environment. So um, there are a few sober homes in Longmont. There's some sober living communities outside of Longmont, and at times people get released from the prison system and they are required to move into sober living and there really isn't a lot of affordable sober living so they can't, they, they leave their communities to try and find affordable sober living. So it's a, it meets a great need. It meets a need for current residents who may be struggling with the outside resources Harold's talking about, but it also meets community members who may be coming back from treatment, from prison, <coughs> from somewhere that, that the whole environment really is designed to support them staying sober. Yeah. From whatever. Alcohol or drugs. Yeah, yeah. And and I think you should know that they're in a location that is supporting it too. Yeah. Because it's so easy to get triggered. Yeah. You know, when they're in a, they're in an environment that is going to support But in the lease agreement it is built in there that they will do it and probably give them two strikes, one strike, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah that's where the attorney from the board that's comes right. in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm just thinking like yeah. big picture, yeah. that's kind of how it works. Is it? But they have their own community space so that if they're going to a community-based event at the location, they don't have to worry about it in their I community think this space. is all research we still need to dig a little yeah. deeper on because okay. the relapse piece is real. So yeah. Yeah. I think for people uh, using opioids, the average number of relapses is 14. So, I mean, these are things we just have to be conscious of and, yeah. and really try to figure that out. So we're not setting people up to fail again. So. And, and to be honest with you, I think we're, we're seeing it, and, and this is anecdotal, and Lisa can jump in on this, but when, when Lisa and everyone downloads with me, 
you don't see it in the common spaces, you don't see it in the, in the outside smoking areas where it's a problem. Where it becomes a problem is when their neighbor or the person down the hall is. Or, yeah. These yeah. issues come in. So it's really those folks that live in the immediate vicinity where we tend to see the issue. And that's why you want to kind of. Once you get, when you get to your floor, you know you're good because that's where the problems develop. Yeah, yeah. So just having your your unit as your safe haven, you have a whole area, a whole floor. your neighbors, you're you are all in the same boat, so you have that support system right there next to you. Yeah. Which then ties in if we can get something done with the local nonprofit, then they're also there to support. And then what you eventually want to have happen is you have enough resources that you've been able to break in. But now you're not only really so you're working with the entire population. And hopefully the whole community understands that. So even if you're not in the sober living floor or the sober living wing, you have some sense of where you're moving into a space that has that designated. I think that's the development of the so in terms of the alignment with goals, we do have um, conversations scheduled at all um, all of the independent properties, not Briarwood and not Aspen Meadows neighborhood at this point, except for the suites. And so in chatting with Lisa and Melinda, we really feel like a conversation at the suites is probably not the best way to go, but we're gonna try and find a way for folks to weigh in <laughs> on some of the priorities. <laughs> so we have had, um, so no signups here uh, for the today. The, yesterday was the first day of conversations. We didn't read signups, and then we had some difficulty at Spring Creek. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! Um, but they are participating in vote dotting. So um, the last conversation is the last week of this month. I'll go around and pick up all the information, meet with Arlene and Lauren and Cameron, and. We'll try and put a synopsis together by property. Do you think it would just be helpful for me to just be on site at those times, and then if people come by, just strike up a conversation with them? That's up to you. Okay. That's really up to you, and you might want to talk to Andrea about it. You know, it could be a sign, a good sign, that people are pretty comfortable, mm -hmm. that they don't feel like they need any follow through. But <laughs> definitely, it's Spring Creek they have signed up. So, yeah. and I, I think part of it is um, not everybody has seen. The, the notice for right. sign up and they're not used to looking for things like that so I think probably at the next upcoming conversation we can yeah, you know highlight that because a blurb in the newsletter <laughs> yeah but a lot of people no, I know. don't have right. you know there's some people that aren't computer savvy and they don't do you guys yeah. post stuff at the door yeah say what post things at the door yeah, yeah. But some people don't even leave their floor. No, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are people that yeah, they don't come out. Yeah. And we certainly heard that through COVID uh, when we posted mm -hmm. signage about positives. You know, people were like, I don't even leave my apartment because of COVID. How would I know? Yeah. yeah. So, so I think it's just do a small little one third sheet paper to every door to say, go down and vote or, you know, yeah. go vote. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's really the, the piece that's underway relative to the conversation goals. Just push it over the floor. Some of them, you know, we because we have a couple of people that don't come out and they go to me. Let's go on to number six uh, items for input for the LHA Board of Commissioners. A is to uh, the 4.1 LHA audit. So, I don't know what the input I think she just wanted me to give you a basis of what's going on with okay. the LHA. Yeah, yeah okay. um, so we got uh, our draft on Friday. Well, we got it as soon as they got done with the audit, we got a draft so I could start working on it. Um, they did a final on Friday. They're looking at one, they're looking at the A dissolution right now to make sure it's being reported correctly because of the gas leaking 62 issue. Um, it may need to be just a change in that position versus you know, reporting an income. So that's the one thing that could change, but we had zero findings. They found no significant weakness or deficiencies. So for our single lot, so we are here. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So that's like the biggest, the biggest mess. And they for 
appreciated the, the clean, you know, having the full staff um, and our systematic process, having clean general ledger, um, being able to provide the reports and have quick responses. So we really appreciated all of that as well. And you guys drafted the financial statements directly? They didn't do it? They, so they, they draft them. Okay. So that wasn't the issue. Because when they gave that financial statement finding, right. mm -hmm. which we were really confused about, <clears throat> it wasn't that piece. It was because the auditors were doing the journal entries. They were there. Mm -hmm. So they were doing the pension for them. They were doing the depreciation schedules. Mm -hmm. And so that there was no separation. And so that made them not really drafting their own financials. So us doing all of those journal entries ahead of time got rid of that problem. Because that's what we're like, we have to do a financial statement package, and then Alexis clarified that said, no, no, we do all that. That's not a problem. It's the problem. The problem is, is that you know at the end of the year they had two pages of journal entries of adjusting journal entries that they had to do because the auditors were doing the work for them. So that was one. Okay. Good. Um, yes. The other piece that we have to figure out is <laughs> next year. So I'm working on the RFP um, for a new auditing firm to go out and see kind of this and post that. Um, but the biggest piece is if LHA is going to be going to the city's auditors, or if we're going to actually roll that into the package. That's what I have. Part of me thinks that because we're not a unionist, we need to just go out and have a separate auditing firm do LHA because then it's just easier on the city side to drop Then the city audit. auditor can just take, mm -hmm. take that. And, um, it's getting into the Gatsby rules of ancillary organizations and what you have to include in your CAFR. And that's what's creating the nuance. But I think that's really that's sort of the time to do it. So that's the only caveat. I know I have to go out for the properties and LHTC <coughs> at the moment, um, but LHA could go underneath the city um, and it would change how we report to in FDS. <laughs> um, but what's your time frame on that, Kendra? Um, I need to get it out probably within the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Valerie's worked on finding some draft or templates for me from other housing authorities so I don't have to build it from scratch since this is my first time that we built as well. So well we can always get the RFP out and then if something changes on the city auditor we can just stop the thought. Can I have some recommendations on how to reach out to Well it'll go out through Mallory. Oh. I mean it's going to get broadcasted. <laughs> but if you have vendors, yeah, just you just need to get their name and contact information. Yeah, we can ask them to go list out. Who's notified? <laughs> They're really good, but the problem is, is HUD has came down and said we haven't went out to bid in forever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we always have to. I mean, technically, we could stick with them. But yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they can yeah. read it. Yeah. yeah, and I told them they can read it, and we'll let them yep. know when it's out there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely. You know, and they're the lowest bidder. I, I mean, I really liked. I mean, we could we could I, even request a different partner. On too. Do we have to go to the lowest bidder? Or is it one of those situations where you can go? I'll have to read what our procurement was. Because we don't always go with the lowest bidder. It's, it's how they fit your scope. So yeah. as long as you have your evaluation criteria yeah. ahead of time, you can pick who you want to pick who best meets your value criteria, of which cost is one. One factor, yeah. yeah. But it's also a professional service. So because exactly. it's a professional service, you're not restricted to the lowest cost. Mm -hmm. And our procurement policy, and I think we need to make sure that we put in in the request that somebody's familiar with development corporations and absorbing development corporations into the housing authority because if they're not key on that, they're going to step into a. Yeah. Well, yeah, what's like the number of <coughs> clients that they have for each of those? Right. You know, what's their single lot experience? What's their HUD experience? Right. Yeah. Okay, here's the one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, I just know that's part of it. I yeah. part, that has to be part of the equation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no, what uh, we can't find. When, or did you ever find when it was bid out? 
Um, Am I getting it confused with the, the other stuff? We had a Grand Junction. I talked with Grand Junction, and they had it bid out. I mean, it was pretty comparable to what we were paying at, at the time. So, but I mean, when did the housing authority bid out to bring our Bailey out? Know, so those are the kind of the, yeah. those are but that's kind of the, the cleanup that we're having to get into is so we took it over assuming that they have been bidding on schedule and doing what they're supposed to and then they haven't and so then um, I mean we're seeing these in pockets and uh, so I think this is the last big one that we, we found in so as LHDC's role changes or goes away, how is that aligned with HUD and these two properties and the those board of directors that we talked about earlier? First thing. So Al, so the the expectation for the first year of the lodge is to become um, a RAD program. So that'll move into the voucher program. And when they become a RAD program, they get to pick the housing authority that they want to manage that for. So they would select so the, the So the LHDC's role as a board of directors goes away at that time. <laughs> then usually what? And if HUD allows it, then they'll, they'll review the advance. We have to look. There's capacity um, loans out there that are provided, and we also have home. So we have to touch, touch base with on the home side of it, um, the state side. This is the longest. This is the one <clears throat> that has the longest horizon on this solution. I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So what I want to underscore, to, uh, I mean, really the work that the entire team's doing, because this has really been a project of Lisa and the property managers working with Kinder and the finance people. Um, and, and you've heard me say this before, but to go from the audits that we had two and a half years ago yeah. to the audits that we have now where they're completely clean. Um, it was a monumental task by all of the staff and has put us in a drastically different position. And I think that's what made the difference in Sunset Heights. So when we got the re review from the Department of Housing to Chapa on Sunset Heights, we got the highest level review you could possibly get. We weren't anywhere close to that when we stepped in last year and tried to do this as we were doing it. So it's just under, I mean, I just really want to reiterate the work that they did to take us from here to here has been tremendous. So great job, everyone. Yeah. Great news to hear. Let's go on to number seven items, not part of the LHA workforce goals. Anybody have anything? Uh, going on to number eight, <clears throat> LHA report A, update on operations. Yeah, let's go, let's first jump to uh, you, Harold, down to B first, I think, for the executive director. Just so you got to leave in 10 minutes. <clears throat> 10 minutes. Um, I've given most of my updates on these other agenda items. Um, I think the thing that we're still trying to work through is um, what I would say generally is the accountability process, and Lisa can talk through this. Um, I don't know, I think we said this to you all, but I don't know if we did. Um, in terms of what we're able to process and bring to the, to the court system, um, we're only able to bring two a week. And so it's a backlog from COVID. And, and so as you hear from, uh, different facilities about accountability and how people are acting. I think one thing that we have to remember is we went through about a year and a half, almost two years of no evictions. The only evictions that you could get in place were those that were significant um, health, safety. health, safety, and I mean, they had to really hit this high bar. Um, so there were, we were limited to what we could do. Now, as we're coming out of the, the COVID world, I mean, just generally there's a backlog in private and public and affordable. Um, and so we can only take two a week and that's on Friday. Basically, Lisa's been living 
um, at the courthouse on Fridays yeah. um, because of, of what we're having to do to bring these forward. Um, we have made progress specifically at the suites, um, but it's just gonna, I think, be an ongoing workload for us because of what happened here in COVID. Um, associated with that, I think, again, talking about the staffing and talking about uh, folks in, in our HCV component, um, they're also working with Lisa where um, we, we had a, a technical eviction that we had to do, but they were able to work with the individual so they wouldn't lose their voucher. And so they were actually able to keep the person housed, but allow them to be housed in a facility to handle their needs. And so it wasn't creating an issue for the unit, for the facility that we were talking about. And so we really have a lot of work that we're starting to engage in. Michelle's and Lisa have been leading this is really almost an intake to go, what are we dealing with? You know, what's the issue at hand? How do we resolve it? And we've got more work to do, um, but really trying to find creative solutions so we can keep people housed because the reality for us is, um, and this is the connection to the city. If somebody becomes unhoused, they just become uh, an issue to another part of the organization as we're trying to do it. So the idea is how do you keep people housed and, and how do you work those solutions? And so um, I think Marcus was the one that worked. Marcus did a phenomenal job. He brought that experience and doing some of this from South Carolina where he worked. And so what we're finding is, is we're bringing these folks they're bringing other experiences in that we may never have seen. Um, and so Michelle and I talked a little bit about um, how we can maybe formalize this um, in ways that we do with other programs, uh, but we're, we're still dealing with issues. Um, and um, it'll probably take us what, another two months to get through those, based on the two a week. Um, <clears throat> and now is that based upon the company or the organization? It's only two per organizational company. The judge yeah. only wants to hear basically two from property management company right. to allow time to because everybody's on backlog. Right. Yeah. So. right. so yeah, so housing is Walmart Housing Authority can send two. Yeah. Even though we might have multiple properties. Yeah. 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 And and it's a it's a challenge. And at the same time we're really trying to work with folks to not have <laughs> yeah. If they're willing to work with us. The mm -hmm. the other thing as far as a management update is so as a city, um, we have contracted with the National Development Council. I think we've talked to you all about this before. Um, they do affordable housing, they do economic development, um, but they they are very familiar with um, all the federal tax programs. Um, we allocated 1.5 million in ARPA to, to figure out how do we do affordable assisted living because what we're finding is that many of the issues that we have in our age restricted properties are probably because we have people that need to be in assisted living but they can't afford to live in assisted living. Go ahead. There's another sign to that, the requirements to be, be uh, qualified for assisted living is on way stricter mm -hmm. and actually uh, in our senior housing we're filling a gap that right. does not exist so if we're looking at senior assisted we need to not have to be restricted to the requirements that assisted living has right now and, and because it, it is a real gap mm -hmm. and it's um, uh, I, I don't want us building an assisted living that limits us being able to move people to a safer place for them. There is, there is some alternatives, which and okay. it's so funny, I'm cleaning out my office and we talked about it more recently, but even in 2007, Michael Reese was talking to PACE about a partnership with PACE, which brings services into independence. So those, those that approach could could look differently. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bricks and mortar assisted living. It could look like the support services that would help them maintain independent living. Mm -hmm. there, there could be some different ways to look at that. 
so or it's both. Or it's both. And uh, right. and so anyway, the National Development Council. Um, I think what we've learned is they probably have been involved in. Uh, I think they said almost fifty percent of the national development and affordable assisted living. And so they're bringing a, a, a skill set that um, I think will really help us on this. And and so we're going to, it's on the development list, but it is so far away that it's not on it. But we do have money that we're, that we're time limited to, to spend in six years. And so there, that's one of the, the top projects that we put for them to work with us on. So. Um, you know, that's kind of what we're doing is we're, we're contracting and leveraging expertise because um, we can never afford to, we can never afford to, at least in the yeah. next six yeah. years to do that. But that's something that that, um, the housing authority, did, are we contributing to that at all or no? Can you see? We may have to work it into the budget next year to have a small contribution because some of the work is going to be done. But when I mean small, I think their 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 contracts are 125,000 a year, 150, and so the DDA is part of it because they do downtown redevelopment financing. City's part of it because of the economic development, the redevelopment component. Housing. So we're splitting this cost amongst multiple agencies to, to minimize the impact. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that PACE has done, so PACE is determined by geography. So our PACE is true on uh, our block yet. They have an agreement, for example, with Beatrice Hover Assisted Living. And so they are helping people move from independent to assisted via those kinds of arrangements they're making partnership so they might be supporting somebody in independent when it really becomes clear they need more and PACE is actually doing the case management and helping make that shift and so they're working their partnerships and, and I really think it's an opportunity in a for short term because I, you're talking long term in terms of the bricks and mortar but in a short term way I think it's worth a conversation with PACE of what that would look like and I think Michael started it many many years ago and just it didn't ever fully yeah. engage. Yeah. So that yeah. come in. That is a recent uh, presentation or um, yeah, he may give me its own presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh being the sign from the top of the conversation. Absolutely. Yes, I think that, that is valuable information for a group of people. Right. And, and then our our job is to know. Uh, especially if that if Pace can bring that service to the properties. Right. Uh, but I'm not sure everybody is aware that that's possible. So the resource staff are making those connections as yeah. they see folks. Yeah. Um, if, so it's it's an opportunity. That's yeah. all. Not no, not no. that not that all answer, but it, yeah. it could be a piece of the continuum. The limiting factor I think you're referring to, Jean, is, is whether or not you then drop into a Medicare program. And I think in some cases you almost need to to help the financing, but. Um, Medicaid, 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 yeah. Um, when I went to um, Minnesota to, to see my mother-in-law before she passed, you know, they have facilities there that are a lot like this, that they're maybe six floors. And so the, the top floor was like the high intense assisted living. Um, the next two floors were assisted living, but at a lower level. And then the, yeah. you know, the bottom three were mm -hmm. uh, normal age-restricted living. And so they almost had a way in that facility to kind of, as people evolve over their lifespan, mm -hmm. they literally just moved them within the facility and they didn't have to displace them and from their care groups that they had yeah. already right. established. Right. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that we've got to look at. Yes. And um, awesome. but we're on the front end of this, and it'll probably take us a while. Okay. I think the Cinnamon yeah. Park model is an interesting one to look yeah. at for yes. sure. Yeah. Local yeah. Cinnamon Park. So Cinnamon oh, Park Cinnamon built Park, yeah. the two assisted, mm -hmm. and then they just opened. They're independent, mm -hmm. but as time progresses, if you want the services from assisted living, you want to go over and eat your meals there or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. There's a cost factor, but at least they have that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Another one I have that is independent skilled nursing 
and then a fit in literature that goes, you know, yeah. so. Yeah. Well, there's several of those throughout the county. Mm -hmm. The difference with Cinnamon Park is it's affordable and yeah. their right. assisted living takes Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Many of the assisted livings throughout the county do not take yeah. Medicaid. Yeah. It's like seven grand a month. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So Medicaid doesn't even but the interesting thing with Beatrice Hover is they have never taken Medicaid, but yet they have this relationship with PACE, which is very exciting. I think. I thought they were taking Medicaid now at the greenhouses. They allow four of the unit, four of the apartments out of what twenty yeah, to be Medicaid. Yeah, but Beatrice Hover, as the assistant living assistant, yeah. never took Medicaid until now they're working with. Pace. Mm -hmm. So something has changed, which is great. So, yeah. yeah. So there's mm -hmm. options. That's all. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about Christman is, I mean, this is how you build teams. The developer that we're working with, or not Christman, the development we're, we're working with at Christman is the developer that did Cinnamon Park. Mm -hmm. So then if we can take that developer and match them with NBC, then you get people that are somewhat familiar with this concept and then you can go. So that's how you build teams. So everyone who came back from the Cinnamon Park open house talked about the large closets. What a fabulous idea large closets were. So that was very interesting to hear. Yeah, very I mean, it was like, wow, I've never heard so many people talk about like, closets. That is always the thing in affordable housing is people, they lack closet space. You normally don't have a hall closet, the, and that's where they take the square footage is the closet. <laughs> it was very interesting. Yeah. Like, I didn't see that. It's the closet space. It's that way in homes these days. Yeah. <laughs> Anything for me before I leave? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's go back to A, update our operations occupancy report. Um, so I've included the uh, for, um, April, sorry, April occupancy as of May 1st. Um, we are sitting at 95% occupied. Um, you'll see there's some meth units now floating around. I'll go through those more in the property details. Um, we've closed all of our waiting lists, so we are working through waiting lists to fill occupancy. Um, it's been a little bit slower this past month because we've been down two property management staff. One transitioned over to Molly's team, and then we had one leave. So I have been filling in on site at Aspen, so I see Jean almost every other day. <laughs> and um, another team member came back from maternity leave. So we actually were down three for almost a month period. So one came back from maternity leave, and that left us down to I'm filling a third of a spot and then our other assistant manager is floating around now to four properties as of this week so no andre's andre's the manager here it's yeah. krista so you guys um krista's at the suites fall river spring creek and now started at village place last friday mm -hmm. <laughs> so i'll move over into the property updates give a few um things the fire department um is scheduled to be at Coffees and Conversations May and June. So far, we've had two not so great <laughs> outcomes. They were they did the lodge last month. They showed up, got a call three minutes in, left, came back, and then had a brush fire call. We had the brush fire team here, so they had to leave again um, and didn't show up. And then last week we had Spring Creek, and they were an hour late due to calls. But we I, I reached out to Michelle Goldman who's the lieutenant, and let her know, you know, we are understanding, we understand emergencies come before LHA. <laughs> and so we work to reschedule. We're trying again today here. We're um, going to have the fire department come here. And this is at the resident's request after two years. They want to know how to shelter in place, what's the proper protocols, um, evacuation procedures, what to do if they're stuck in their apartment because they would have a wheelchair, walker. So the fire department's going to be here to educate them on that. Another big, th a big thing coming is we have tentatively scheduled for August 11th a fair housing training, and this is going to be a joint training. Um, Susan Spaulding with the city has put me in connection with an attorney who's really familiar with Colorado, Colorado fair housing, all the different things, um, and he'll be coming in and doing a three-hour presentation. We're inviting all the advisory board members, the city council members, all of the LAJ team, um, Michelle's team. Um, community and neighborhood resources, children, youth, and family. So anybody who's interacting with an LHA tenant will kind of know 
where we come from with fair housing and how what we do for one, we have to do for other. If we're giving you a bottle of water, everybody's getting a bottle of water. <laughs> and I think that's where some of these um, joint agencies not having worked with LHA too much when we say, well, if we do that for one, we got to do it for all. And kind of take that approach, um, touch a little bit on reasonable accommodations, but really focus on liabilities where, where we can get in trouble, where not just the organization could be sued or held liable, but each person could be held liable mm -hmm. for their interactions or what they say or what they do. So I think it's going to be very successful. I think it's going to be very educational to all the teams. And we got a killer deal. The guy's going to do it um, for $1,000 up to 40 attendees, so for four hours total. So. What's reservation? Um, I will be sending out a calendar invite. So. <clears throat> Where is this going to be? It's going to be at the museum. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But I will make sure you all um, get counter invites to that. Um, landscaping contracts um, went into effect August, August, sorry, April 16th. Um, residents are really excited this year because before we only had a mowing contract, and this year they're actually coming out, cleaning up the landscapings, trimming up the bushes, mm -hmm. instead of letting, or depending on maintenance to do it, or residents. We actually have people out there, so that's been a big change, and I've heard a lot of comments on that at coffees and conversations. Um, property updates: so the suites we've had that one meth unit down. Um, they they're in process of rebuilding it. Drywall, AC, cabinets were all delivered last week, so we're hoping to have that. Their goal is to have it back online by the end of May, first of June. Um, have a second unit that is pending cleaning. Um, we've been. It's been hard to get the cleaners in with the tester because of the Marshall fire. It's the same crews that are doing the mold testing and everything else from the fires. Um, they're the same companies doing the cleanings and remediation for people to start building it. And so we are split in where impossible yeah. for both testing and cleaning. Um, we had an eviction granted on, on um, April 29th, um, and that unit is currently pending testing the guy vacated over the weekend prior to the sheriff coming out, so we, we have a feeling that's going to add to three mess units there. Um, but we have brought in the restoration team that is working on that one unit that we took so long to get started on. They they are great. They're communicating weekly with updates of where they're at. They're, um, we're informing them of these meth units and they're actually going to be working with our testers so that as soon as a unit does test positive, they will be able to go in with code enforcement and everybody and get start planning so that they can order the supplies and have them on hand once we get the all clear to begin instead of having to wait. Oh, we need an HVAC because that's kind of slowed us down. They, they didn't get in until later in the process. And so then they have to order it and it's three to four weeks out. And so it slows down. So they're, they're ready to get in there, start getting their list started before cleaning's even done. Uh, management has completed inspections of all the units at the suites. Um, so we're working on the two years of maintenance items along with um, starting to handle things that we may have not been aware of because of COVID, we weren't going into the units. So um, the hoarding, working with um, Melinda there at the suites with the MHP team, working through um, just other concerns we're seeing when we're in units and working through that process, but now that we know about it, we can address it timely. Um, Aspen Meadows Senior, Palace Construction, who did the remodel, just installed a um, pathway from the parking lot into the, well, over into the benches so that residents have better access um, before they had to go through the actual parking spaces to get to the benches. And up over the grass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And rocks, so and they, rocks, made, yeah. uh, they um, did this as a volunteer project for LHA. See. They're starting to resume um, um, activities. They had a Mother's Day and birthday celebrations this last month. And then... Um, oh, this month. This month, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Palace Construction, um, with the whole resyndication remodel, the flooring that was installed uh, was has a manufactured defect. So not just Aspen Meadows Senior, but every property that had that flooring installed is having issues. It was a floating um, LTC and it's failing, it's peeling, 
it's splitting, it's coming apart. Um, so <laughs> yes. um, it's, it's interesting. So Powell's construction, will, we're gonna replace a test floor. So the second floor North Wing um, on June 6th will be replaced with what they're proposing will be better flooring that will hold up and endure walkers. We're putting it in that hallway because we do have some wheelchair and walker activity and that's the, that area is already beat up pretty well. So we figured this will be a good test floor to test over a few months before we start having to go into all the common areas, all the resident units. So Molly and I are already talking, yes. <laughs> is there a reason you chose the day for doing that? Oh, no. <laughs> I just figured I was back from, from vacation and that it was past rents and the people would be, well, I have to go to the bank and get this so that it be a yeah. good day to keep everybody in one place. And, and, and is that covered under any sort of warranty or anything? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So, so we're just trying to find the best mm -hmm. stuff. That we want to do Correct. Best and then stuff. once we've identified the best flooring, we're going to work with Palace. Um, we've put this all on their plate to come up with a timeline, how, how many units per day, and what their plan is for the units, um, and everything. And then so, the resource, what we're going to need to support the residents. So Yeah, because, yeah, okay. Yeah. They have to be displaced by my understanding where it's eight to five. That's for the hallway. The hallway. It yeah. probably won't take that uh, time, but, but just in but case it runs over. Yeah, having places to go and seniors need naps in the afternoon, and that's not going to happen. Well, yeah. and when they start to really, when they start to work in the units themselves, that's what that's what we're talking, we're talking hallways and individual units. Yes, so we're all we're all right. Right. Yeah. 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 It's just manufactured, like with appliances, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They even need roofing. Yeah, and the roofers, I think, are coming out, or we're just out to look at some of the stuff. Corinne can probably fill you in on that. <laughs> so I know they've been in contact, but but nothing like the flooring. <laughs> yes. The neighborhood, um, the map meth containment needed unit there, which is a three bedroom townhouse, um, has clear testing. The jester has been out and we're just waiting for the contractor to come back with all his bids because that one was, um, we're not sure possibly cooking in the unit. They had to sandblast the garage even without drywall all the way up from the garage up, all that drywall had to be ripped out. So, um, so hopefully we can start working on that one and that one will turn into a manager's unit. We've already got that approved by CHAPA. So um, Corinne will lo relocate on site to have better eyes and ears there at the neighborhood. <laughs> um, Briarwood, we just had a DOLA inspection. So they went into four units, no major findings. Um, what there was was more of the resident things that they've done, the octopus of the electrical outlets and stuff like that that have already been addressed with the residents. Alvin. For the LHDC properties, um, Sarah and Dave from Longmont PD have been out doing copies and conversations. Um, we had a really high resident um, attendance to that. I want to say probably about 60 to 70 percent of the residents showed up for that um, because that is on Main Street, so we do have a transient problem. Um, they did a lot of education about who, when, and where to open the door for, but also what to do if you're intimidated by the person because we had um, a smaller senior come in and the guy wanted to follow her and was probably twice the size of this resident. And so kind of David Sarah, educate him. Don't do anything, don't address it, just go to your apartment, call 911. That's what Longmont police are there for. They're not gonna scrutinize you for calling 911 if it's not an emergency. That's what public safety is there for. So it was a really good educational event for them at Village. Um, and currently the manager position is vacant. We had a great interview yesterday, so I already heard back from one reference, doing two more reference checks today and hopefully making an offer by the end of the day. So, got lucky on this one. <laughs> um, Spring Creek, um, we're addressing a meth contaminated unit there. Um, it was very minimal 
contamination. So we're hoping just the cleaning will do and have that one back um, by the end of the month. In lieu of coffees and conversations, we held an ice cream social, which was well intended. We were supposed to have the fire department, but they were delayed. So we did ice cream social and the residents just had a kick out of it. Um, probably had about, out of 60 residents, 35 to 40 attend. <laughs> the ice cream brought them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Fall River, um, they've resumed their garden club and um, with increased resident participation. This property opened during COVID, so they never really had many activities. They didn't have any gatherings. They don't know, and they've all they've ever had is garden club. But this year, they had a lot of people reach out, wanting to participate, wanting to be involved. Um, we've kind of set some guidelines for the first time this year of what it entails to be a good club member, um, cleaning up after your space, you know, not picking other people's vegetables. Um, it's we've had to have those conversations, but it's been well received and. Um, I'd say every planter is being shared by two residents and well, well received and really anticipated. Um, they're working to um, form committees. We had our coffees and conversations last week and that was the biggest thing. Everybody's like, we want to gather, we want to do this. And so they started forming on their own, their committees, their groups, and um, how to proceed on that. Hearthstone, our maintenance position was filled last week um, with Calvin. He, brings on years of experience, full service truck. Um, anything you want to add about Calvin? Very educated. Uh, you might look a little rough, but he's only a hard head. Good job. And very good to the residents. Um, so educated, well-mounted, experienced. And he's actually been um, consulted for some of our vendors we've used previously. So when I was talking about some stuff with him, he's like, oh yeah, I'm aware about that. So-and-so called me from this company about that. And so he kind of already brings that knowing what we need. Um, with, with him aboard, I believe we can do a lot more in-house plumbing than we should receive in a larger thing. And I'll actually go back a step. I'll go up to the suites. Um, last week we had an AC unit go out. Um, heat pump. The heat pump, yes, sorry. Uh, no problem. Uh, vendor proposals were looking to be about $12,000. And I think with what he's provided me and Dave has provided me, we'll be able to do it in-house for less than 3,000. Yeah. So significant <coughs> savings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, moving on to Hearts, uh, well, I was on the Hearts one. Oh, and the um, residents working to organize their clubs as well. They've got quite a few birthday celebrations going on. They've got their library group going on. They're, they're really active. Um, the lodge next door, um, they're kind of a quieter property. They don't really want to socialize or anything, so not much going on there, but they did have a, I will call it an uninvited guest in the early mornings when um, that did result in some um, theft and minor property damage right around a thousand dollars. So, and it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we've taken measures to prevent that the person used, came in using a code, um, so we're working with the residents, they have coffee and conversations today, so we're gonna let them know that as of probably um, June 15th, we will be deleting all codes out because they do have their fob and they do have access to call themselves from the call box to let them in and even pick out a neighbor or a friend that they can call from the call box if they don't have their phone or fob to get in. We can actually keep notes there because they're the management system and so they can keep that in our own experience that they're Yes, yes, you don't want codes. <laughs> well, in this one, I thought last time we talked about like a vendor code that they had used. So this was, was this the same one or is this different? Yeah, um, well, this that one was a vendor code. Okay. <laughs> same, same one, mm -hmm. but we're not sure if that person just guessed and it happened to be the vendor code or right. that the person had some relationship to the vendor. Okay. That we're not sure. Right. So okay. we're trying to be careful about not yeah. calling it a vendor code. But did they just get lucky? <laughs> yes, make a lucky guess at him. Um, open positions, we're still interviewing for custodian positions, haven't had much traffic on that. And we're recruiting for the assistant manager for Aspen Meadows Senior and Aspen Meadows Neighborhood and recruiting for manager at Village Place, but like I said, I hope to make an offer today. The custodian positions, do they include benefits and all that? It starts at 18. Seventeen or eighteen dollars an hour with benefits with full city. Benefits. I think okay. part of the thing is I'm working with HR because this was a position we posted 
LHA before we kind of fully went into the city, so it's only on Indeed, it's not through the city being posted and recruited for continually. So I'm working with HR to move that fully in to the city's posting, so hopefully generate some more traffic. The other thing that Lisa has kind of jumped into um, is um, when the Marshall Fire occurred, uh, Boulder County um, really reached out to the long-term care and senior communities, and so they have actually now, I wish we had had this through COVID, they actually have an independent senior living community kind of group talking about emergency preparedness. So I think COVID probably opened people's eyes to the senior communities um, because we were treated, as you all know, different than long-term care. And there wasn't a lot of real specific guidance. We were kind of interpreting guidance to what made sense. And so Lisa has now connected with that group and um, that I think is just gonna dial up some support and some just hopefully some good direction. And it's already showing, um, I, not just me, from, uh, we have um, Kevin Esmail from City of Longmont Emergency Management. He sits in all the meetings as well. So it's kind of getting us forward thinking. So say the Marshall Fire was to happen here. Where would we evacuate to? How would we evacuate those residents who don't have vehicles? How would we be accountable for them? Um, and those sure. folks that need the extra care. Yes, so it's helping us get stuff in place. Harold's been in some of the talks after the meetings, like who do we access? Who would we call first? Who's our second call? Who's our third call for transportation? So it's, it's really getting everybody talking how, uh, I know Michelle and I have had some talks, like if it's Fall River Spring Creek, we would evacuate here, Village Place, where we have a little bit more open space for those who need somewhere to go, who aren't going to family or friends' houses. So, and just getting that whole plan in place, if ever. Yes. So I'm really glad it's a, it's a good thing. And then another thing on here that Carol kind of talked about is the, we're calling what, the eviction pause? Yeah. So, <laughs> so when somebody's facing eviction, say they, um, it's not stopping the process, so they're still gonna get a 10 day demand for compliance because they violated the lease. But anybody can call a cause. It could be Michelle's team, it could be my team, it could be anybody who's worked with this person saying, hey, let's talk about this. And we're doing it, we're all coming together, and it's a group made up of people a resource person. If it's a family property, then it's going to be children using family. If it's a senior, somebody from Michelle's team. Um, sometimes we've had adult protective services sit in on the meetings. Um, we've had a mediator from the city sit in on the team. Somebody from property management, if they're a voucher holder, will have a voucher person in on that to go through all the consequences and try to figure out what's the best solution. As Harold said, you know, we might have somebody who's not fit for the property they're living at but could benefit from somewhere else. So then that's when the whole team can work together and figure out where this person needs to go. Or what are the steps for them to get back into compliance with their lease? Is it, do they just need resources? Do they have unauthorized animals and all this other stuff? Well, what do we need to do to get you unauthorized animal authorized? And what steps do you need to take? And what resources do you need to get them licensed within the city, get them vaccinated? Uh, and just walking through those. It could be for something small, it could be for something big. It, it's a meth unit and they need other resources. We may not be able to provide those, but we can help point them in the right direction and have them sign that mutual rescission. So if they are a voucher holder, they're not, they're not hurting themselves in the future. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of things we're doing with this. I'm, I'm calling it a pause. And, and it could be called at any time. It could be called while they're going through the process. It could even be called after the process. I had an eviction recently that I did not feel good about it was granted through the courts, and I thought about it all weekend, and my first call Monday morning was to Michelle. Like, we, we need to do something, so. And we pulled the team together, and we were, I think, came with a pretty successful outcome. And it doesn't relieve the resident of the burden of their behavior. Um, and we also are really, in the same way, recovering from two years of no inspections. We're recovering from two years of people. And in some cases, years beyond that. So we're trying to be as mindful about we, LHA, let this go on so long. So we're trying to be mindful about trying to give not the same amount of time to recover or change behavior, but something that feels a little bit more like we're really trying to let you know you gotta stop. 
I mean, yeah. I thought it was a mess issue. It's an automatic eviction regardless, right? Yeah, it will. Even if, it, yeah, it's even if it wasn't the resident. Yes. Even if it was their son who was visiting. So we have to have proof. Yeah. yeah. So with proof. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then there's a chance for a mutual rescission so that they yeah. can get out. It doesn't go on their record, but at least um, move it on. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then we're working with the courts to get some of this, um, when it is substantial damages, um, that we can go back to the courts within so many, such a time frame and add that to the judgment that this is included, whatever the meth damage is. So our attorney's really good about that now. So. Dave, do you have any updates for the properties? Dave was just sorry, I gotta back up. Um, April 18th promoted to uh, maintenance supervisor for LAJ, a position we haven't had before. Yes. So. <laughs> Not really. Um, I try to survey, I do drive these properties every morning, try to survey the property, touch base with all the individuals that are working with us to you know, help us improve. Um, try to keep the line of communication open with myself, management. Guys doing work. So. <laughs> so maybe you haven't even seen these yet, but we just had these made last week for it was something one of our maintenance guys brought up saying whole things are just that maintenance are in the unit so that they can hang these on there on the outside, but also when they complete, it's in English and Spanish what they've done. So on the back it kind of just uh, just basic maintenance completed, AC filter change, so some type of Correspondence and communication with the residents. Yeah. So the residents do like the communication. They like to know that they, my voice is being heard. Mm -hmm. So we just got these in last night. Fresh <laughs> nice. Yes. Yeah. I got a killer bill. I used a forty percent off coupon. <laughs> she was less than me when there's money involved. Like you're gonna yell at her. She's got some people with critters. That's Where did you get these pens? Just a print. I love this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so they they emailed in a forty percent off coupon, and so for what we were gonna pay for, can I take one of these? Yeah, a thousand. We ended up getting almost five thousand for the same price. Little piece of paper that got reading. Guy just slipped in the door and shut it. Yeah. So. Close in the loop. That is just what we folks have been asking for. So. Very much. Yeah. Well, and I just think as a as a woman, if I'm coming home to my property and there's someone in my unit, when I put my key in the door, if I see this, I'll know there's someone literally in my. That's unit. where my door is unlocked. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing is, um, did they come or didn't they? Speak? Yeah. And that's always the thing. Again, mm -hmm. we get a question, so that would be that answers both questions. Right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nice. This is really nice. Yeah. Yeah, Amazon wanted like for 130 bucks, and so I was like, oh, I can make one. <laughs> Lisa and her cricket. It's 8 a.m. <laughs> 2 a.m. Smoking signs on the front door that says spoke for community. Like on Amazon, they're like 12.99 for one. I can for 12.99, I can make 50 of them. Yeah, I'm calling you. <laughs> we might need some for the smoke rash. <laughs> Oh, so that is my after hours work projects. Very good deals. Let's go on to age receivables. So um, we've made some progress, but it's become a summer project now. <laughs> now that we're out of our audit period, um, what we're going to start lo looking at is all the ledgers. I've already started it. We're sending the financial packets out every month, not only to Lisa, but to the property managers. Along with notes that say this is a property manager review, take a look, there's something wrong, um, here's what you think's wrong, um, or or that it's a current balance owed by the tenant, or it's a current credit that the tenant has so they can know to reduce their rent next time. Um, so we're working on that. We're working on a, a process to send to collections. I know evictions is part of it. If, if we can't go to a can only take two. <laughs> um, that's that's an issue, but um, we want to make sure that. So here's here's kind of the caveat: is that security deposits are really small. So when somebody moves out and there's that, or the the units hundreds, it could be a really large charge, or it could 
swoop up all the security deposit and label very small. That's not really worth to send to collections. And so we got to figure out what that fine point is to say we just need to write it off. Because even to try, I mean, you can try for so long, but at, at what point, you know, if if the person has passed or if the person, you know, if, you know, in those types of situations, we have to determine, you know, and, and update our bad debt policy to outline what that needs to be. Um, and we'll probably, obviously, give you guys some advice on that as well. Because um, I think, you know, we have some that might be 30 bucks or 50 bucks, but to send them to collections, it's, you know, we'd spend more time doing that. Administratively. Yeah. Administratively, but what? What is that? So we're kind of looking to see. Um, we're also going to start diving in this summer to um, our bank reconciliations. Um, we did that this last year mainly with the vendors, reaching out to the vendors. There's a lot of outstanding checks for the vendors who have been pretty cowardly about taking care of on another invoice that was screwed up. You know, we found we were imbalanced, voided those checks. But there are a lot of checks out there for residents that never got cashed. They may have went to the wrong area. They may not have known how to use the system to put the right address in. So it just got bounced back to us. I have, you know, a list of checks in my drawer, um, just of checks that have bounced back. They either, you know, it's almost like we send them out too early. They haven't changed the address. It's going to come back to us. So what we want to do is reach out to all of the community managers, see if they have an updated address. Try that first. Um, and if not, we need to go to town and talk to them, um, which I don't think was being done at all. So my staff might have some addresses and updates on the okay. senior properties, people who live there. And then on the HCB side, there's a lot of people that get utility reimbursements, and they're like $1, $2 checks. So we have, you know, people that have 10 checks that they've never cashed. So maybe if we put all those and they're still in our system, we send them a ten dollar check that might get <laughs> that might get cashed versus a, a one dollar check that's just you know. And some of them are so old that you know maybe it just wasn't even worth it to go to the bank. Maybe they have mobile deposit now. Maybe it would be a different situation. But we're going to work on that this summer to get all of that part of our bank reconciliations cleaned up and sent to that's kind of where we are there. Um, the, on the financial side, everything's holding strong. Snow removal is obviously the one that that kicked us. It's for some for some properties, we probably are are definitely going to go over budget, um, or did go over budget for snow removal. We're trying to see if there's cushion in other areas that we're not going to go over. So far, we have good and looking good in, on every property. There's little caveats that are happening around them. It's really hard to budget because if you if, if you say you're going to have this and then you don't have that, then you have something else <laughs> in a completely different category. So um, it's managing those um, caveats between all of the budgets and trying to figure out the best way to handle that. So visually, so especially for the property. So if I'm giving them the financial statements, we may be over budget here, but we have cushion here. So can we move some of that budget here? And do we need to do that visibly, visually, as opposed to them having to dissect it? And so, you know, having a process where we say, you know, you come to me and say, hey, we have over the budget here, can we move this? And we move that, what does that look like? You know, are the investors gonna freak out? You know, it's it's a it's a trickle effect of doing that because the investors also um, approve the budgets and are working at that exact same time. Well, I don't but think they'll have any major issues. I mean, as long as the bottom line is the bottom line, yeah. we're not changing that. I mean, yeah, you can re reallocate any kind of budget if it's needed. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just a big ask. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> they don't ask when you have what you need as backup. Yeah. They definitely ask when you get there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've had, um, for the 2001, we ended pretty good on all the properties. I think every single property had a cash flow surplus. So we were able to work through our cash flow wow. surplus and pay off developer fees. 
Um, we paid developer fees for the suites for the Fall River. Um, in Greek, I think it was Thames that we paid towards, which was, I think, the PR loan. Um, for Aspen <coughs> Mountain Neighborhood, we paid off the remaining developer fee, along with paying more for the mortgage and the management fee that was due. So with the DR loan paid off at Spring Creek, is that what you said? Paid no, it's not paid, paid down. off. It's paid down. It's paid, so okay. Spring Creek is a little different. So right. LHDC is actually paying the state back on a quarterly basis for the disaster recovery. Spring Creek is paying LHDC interest on that. So that's kind of how that transit and that's just how those work so the money comes in either to lha or lhdc and the investors want additional interest on top to the property so they can get um, a greater loss my question was really going to be once the dr is paid off does it change the nature of anything with spring creek so I, I have to look at their cash flow statement, but a lot of the times once once the loans, so there, there's at least probably eight different cash flow priorities and it starts to get down to paying the investors and paying. Um, so when, when they start seeing <laughs> a non-loss, a non when they start seeing you know income, that's gonna be taxable to them. And that's when they're, that's what they don't wanna see. <laughs> so, yeah. if it gets paid off, that's yeah. That's the, the that's not a good thing necessarily for them. Correct. Can't just because then they, 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 they if, you know they get part of the cash flow surplus as well. Right, 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 right. right. We start paying them. Okay. I mean, they do get the the cash benefit, but they don't pay tax at all. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. I, I just meant philosophically in terms of any operation. Or is it a, like you're no longer a DR building folks? That's great. <laughs> but it's really. No, I don't think. I think you'd have to look at the DR. I'm not quite sure how long the uh, affordability is on the yeah. DR. I, I mean, I'm I think sure that's, the state has put, you know, 30, 40 years almost, like yeah. most of the mm -hmm. programs have. Right. Yeah, I, I just think um, <clears> it's <throat> when, when you're no longer a DR building, what does that mean? One question I had was the Aspen Meadows neighborhood. It's a large balance there. Over 90 days. Oh, that is the that is the math there. Mm -hmm. That is the big math there. So, so that's well, we'll get that reimbursed from the insurance then. Some of it, yes. Some of it. Is, is, is the adjuster just got out there a week and a half ago? I want to say because it's been we weren't allowed in there for almost a eight months. So the adjuster, I'm waiting on his number. Um, and then our insurance agent is really good about working with the adjuster to increase for like the suites one. Our bids came in, came in about 20,000 over what the adjuster had said, but they kind of worked together to come to an agreement and they've made a first payment on the suites. So I'm- That doesn't affect the tenant's balance. So this is and the tenant's so balance? Is that the AR or are you talking about Yeah, the I heard the AR. Yeah, that's the tenant. So if that's the charges that we're incurring, get pushed back to the tenant. We've never really actually discussed if we're actually getting insurance proceeds for that balance, what that accounts for. Are they are they required to pay the deductible? Because they, you know, um, so we've never really actually crossed that point. You guys have put those costs on the tenant's balance, and so we've never really, maybe that's something we need to discuss as far as what are we what are we responsible for on the insurance side to do? Like, do are we required to reach out to the tenant to get some of the payments back or is it just insurance will cover it? Yeah, I'm sure about it. Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think <laughs> Right. So maybe we just come up with a you know what's our best estimate of what we're gonna cover and then the rest will refer to the tenant balance and you know, well I was gonna write it off. Oh, but. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the more so is that, um, that we probably need to send it to collections so that they they see that because then you, that you made your best send. effort. So yeah, yeah. yeah. we made our best effort, and then whoever is 
when BCHA gets an minute. application later <laughs> on that same time, we know. Yeah. yeah. That's what we talked about last week at the, um, I attended the, well, Belmont has a tenant landlord group, and I attended my first meeting, but that was one of the things is that, like, when we have these meth units, that my personal stance, and I've talked with our attorney, is that we don't suppress a meth eviction. We can suppress evictions for other reasons, right. but not for meth, because we don't want another landlord in Longmont to go through what we have and incur yes. up to 100000 yeah. And so our attorneys, and I think everybody agrees, that yeah. that's one thing that we will be yeah. firm on, is not suppressing the meth units, but any other one that is a negotiation point in court to suppress that record. Because like I said, we don't want that to be your problem next week, yeah. and they do want that to be seen. Was this person evicted? They they left on a mutual decision, so this oh, would okay. need to show so this collection. Yeah. Gotcha. And one of the other questions I had too was just agreeing the age receivables to the um, the balance sheet. So for instance, like that Aspen Meadows neighborhood mm -hmm. is showing they are balanced at fifty two seven eighty five. But then on the balance sheet, because you know, I'm looking at March to March, right? Yeah. Then Which one? So, so I'm comparing the, the bottom, they are aging one, right? To Aspen Meadows neighborhood? Yeah. So it has a 52785 and the accounts and notes receivable is at 49340 So there are, there are several keys. So this also takes prepaids into okay. account, which that's under a liability. Mm -hmm. So this has both assets, the AR aging has both assets and liabilities okay. tied into the balance. So So that but that column there though has the liability. Prepayable to liability is under the second to the last column. We have the total AR balance. So are you looking at for this is I mean, it's not a huge difference, but I'm just noticing that it didn't tie directly to it. Yeah. I mean, because this is kind of summarized. Yep. Yep. Um, and it may include other things in this balance that maybe aren't there. Yeah, I, I just didn't know if you knew on top of your head or if there, yeah, there might be some minor yeah. receivables that are built in there. Okay. It could also be a point in time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I may have put it too early. But I'll do one. Yeah, if you could just get back to us on that. Yeah. Uh, anything on the VIN, the voucher issuance costs? I think that's the last thing. Yeah, so um, I was, here's the last meeting, but this is what we've started. We've started doing a, um, at the first of the month, that's like the best record of when we do the payments and when we can kind of get a snapshot in time because the vouchers are constantly moving. Um, so um, as of April 1st, we were at kind of 40. 445, now we're at 441, and you can kind of see how it moves. Um, we've already went down to 399. We have three vouchers now that are on hold for court outs. Um, you know, our wait list vouchers right now are 19. So we're looking at, to um, eventually have 421. They issued five new vouchers to tenants. They have three that are scheduled to, with three things which means they'll have out vouchers issued and then there's 12 that has, haven't responded and I didn't quite get an answer and I don't know Erica do you know this do you know if the letters that get sent out how they you have to respond by this and then it gets two weeks from two weeks from the date that the letter got sent and then after that um, they have to come in and actually pick out a pick up a packet okay so then once those get released Erica will issue more vouchers out. Um, I did get um, an email yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to review it, but for most of it, I don't think we lost anyone. Okay. 
So I don't think there's a Native American on sale. I think we got it from the land that we got it in there. Yes. So that's good. Way to go. Yeah. I'm not tra- chasing down the vouchers. So. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Any other business? Well, let's adjourn at 1057.